Okay, let's start that. So lesson six is all about data network models, media, and topology. Uh, I want to get right away when we say media, it's not like video or audio. Media, think about it, is like um, Ethernet, um, let's say port, so those types of physical stuff. They're not like the audio or video that you know. And if you do an IP config on your um, laptops, your terminal, command prompt, you would see that, oh, what media is um, enabled or not? Meaning, is your Wi-Fi um, in, um, able to detect or not? Did you turn it off or on? Is your ethernet access on or off, okay? So we'll be talking about chapter one, and that would give you the a whole glimpse of OSI model, and dig down with chapter three, the data link layer protocols. But before that, I want everyone to read this, either out loud or in your mind. All people seem to need data processing. Just keep that in your mind. All people seem to need data processing. First things first, uh, what is network? Interconnected group of people or devices that are capable of sharing meaningful information with one another. So when you and I talk, that's already a network. Let's say you're my student, I'm your instructor, or let's say I'm a friend, you're a friend, we exchange messages, right? You, I say something, you decode it, so that's, that itself is like a connection now, right? Let's talk about first, again, analogies. Uh, think of your human family networks. You have father, mother, child, another child, so, father can talk to the child, let's say do the chores, the child can also talk back, I don't want to do chores, right? So that's why it's, there's arrow pointing, um, they call it bi-directional instead of unidirectional, okay? So we start off with network of people, okay? Next thing, when we talk about peer network, let's say going back, if this if you combine this father, mother, child, child into one node, we'll call it nodes, one node or one circle, we can call them a family network. And your family network can also extend with store, restaurant, school, and work, right? Again, let's make it easy. Network is just connecting people. You have connections. You went to that restaurant. You go to that school, you have a connection to that school now. You're affiliated. So for a restaurant network, uh, this image has a lot of use case. Aside from it representing, again, the nodes, let's say a customer is a node, and restaurant server is another node, and this is another node. Basically, you connect with them, right? And think of it, I think it's better with a circle. So think of it like this. So let's say there's a, this is a customer, and let's say this is a server, and this is the kitchen or wherever, right? So when you go back there, this model, it looks like a customer restaurant server to whatever it's in the menu network to very applicable to the client and server network. So if you're a customer, you have a menu, it's like you're a user in your laptop, opening up a web browser, checking Amazon, okay? When I order a food, I order something at Amazon, okay? I order a food, the restaurant server does this for me. If I order in Amazon, at the back side that you don't see, there's someone doing it for you as well. It could be the API, it could be whatever, right? And it's the the restaurant server, or the equivalent in whatever you're purchasing in Amazon, whatever happening back end, that would grab the items for you, right? So uh, let's go back to an easier example. Let's say you're just um, looking for a website, you hit the URL, you're a customer, you hit the URL here, and then this server will be the one grabbing the content from the other servers and putting it back to you, okay? 
contact network. Uh, very applicable for us who are graduating, including me. So if you want to have a perfect job, you should expand your network, right? You want to keep in touch with your friends, your teacher, former employer, a friend's friend. That's why I say the weakest connection is the strongest connection all the time, and work associate. So expanding your network allows you to have a higher chance to find that perfect job for you as well. So again, we're seeing this network has a lot of applications already, a lot of analogies in our lives. And now we see a computer network. Basically the same, think of it as the circles that you've seen before. This is a circle, this is a circle, this is a circle, or nodes. And now they're interconnected by either by wires or wireless. So why do we need networks? So if we don't have networks, especially in the old days, we don't have wireless before, and if there's no cable, the other computer can't know what the other computer's information is sending, because there's no way. It's like you want to send a mail, but there's no post postal service, things like that. And But then again, before, we do have other ways to share information. We can have this floppy disk. I don't know if you guys remember, but I used to use that. Um, even USB as well. So that's another method to share information, right? And we also have uh, peripherals. We call them peripherals. Um, basically, we connect them to our computer to do other input-output stuff. Uh, CD-ROM, printer, mouse, I think that's scanner, speaker. Again, it allows the computer to communicate with peripherals, with network. So other stuff that we need it for is basically we need to store something. Our applications need to be somewhere as well. And it's for collaboration. Storage is basically we learn a lot of things about databases already, right? So we can use network to basically pass that information to the database server and store it, right? Applications. Uh, instead of installing everyone to have, let's say, Windows 365, I, I mean, not Windows, Office 365, and having installed Word for each one of you, I can just have you guys access one place and access that application and load that for you. That could work. Collaboration is basically messaging, video conference, and those other kinds of stuff. So, to get to the point again, data communication networks is basically the transfer of data between two points. There's a source, a destination. Again, if I'm talking, I'm the source. You guys are listening. You are the receivers. Could be one, could be many. Yep. So in the textbook, we see the main elements of network model. Again, we start with the source, the source encoder, the trans. Um, Translator, transmission, what was that again? Transmitter, and then the channel, the receiver, so source decoder, and the same, meaning the receiver. Okay, it just only shows that, again, the source, let's say you type something in the internet through a messaging app, um, the source encoder would then encode that information and then the transmitter would be the one to transmit that to a specified channel, right? And then the receiver um, would get it, and then also you should decode it, again, to make it readable to the human, uh, human eyes, and the source would receive it. Because during this phase, this encoder is basically, let's say, wh whatever I'm saying, it's becoming like bits or numbers. And from here, you have to convert, again, the bits to, let's say, letters and characters. Another way that we can give an example is, um, have you ever used a walkie-talkie? The, the, the one that you can um, talk to one another in a short range? Um, I don't know what's the other CD. The paper cup, like Yeah, I like paper cup, but it's more like, uh, it's really a device. It has an antenna. It's Kind of old school, like especially when there's traffic. Okay. Okay. 
So think of it that way. So when someone talks to that walkie-talkie, and they did put it in the same channel with the other walkie-talkie, definitely they won't connect. They should be in the same channel, same line, same frequency. Okay. So this one generalizes that the source or sync should be interchangeable, and you should have the link. And that's uh, I discussed that the link could be physical or not. Could be a network cloud. So for the classification of data communication networks, we would have to discuss the transmission method, the data flow direction, network topology, and geographical coverage. Transmission method, uh, asynchronous and synchronous. So synchronous is the easier concept to understand that basically everything has to be done before it gets to you. So it's like, instead of giving you, uh, let's say you ordered in Amazon, you have, you ordered three items, right? Instead of, I mean, you ordered three items at the same time. Instead of getting different packages, right? You would get the whole package right away. Okay, it waits. It waits to have the three items completed, then send it to you. While as asynchronous could be an example where even though you ordered them all at the same time, they, you would get them one piece at a time. Okay, so kind of like characters. So um, instead of receiving your m message uh, in a big chunk right away, you would see the message, the individual characters in real time. I guess a good example with this if you were collaborating in um, Word Online, right? So what is like an example of the marker blocks in like the old days of forums where you just get little pieces at a time? Um, you can like view them where it's like the smaller one like if you can uh, access a Word document you just get the whole thing right away so you can see everything. Yeah, so I, get, I think with synchronous transmission as well is you can't really access that data because okay. it's not yet complete but you could s with asynchronous you, you already get like a stream mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong yep I'm not smart enough to correct you <laughs> <laughs> this uh, this is just a graphical representation of how each is separated and there goes at a different time intervals and you're getting them in real time. And this one waits it to be finished. Another um, example of uh, synchronous is basically when, uh, I think when you're printing, right? I have a good example of ASD. Go ahead. Uh, YouTube. YouTube. YouTube can't, because of how much data it needs to transmit and it mm -hmm. needs to keep that smooth video experience, what it does is it transmits asynchronously mm -hmm. and it actually doesn't have a lot of the, the checking it does to make sure it has all the data is actually very uh, very light, and so it'll just it just kind of shows you what it got, mm -hmm. which lets them do a better job of sending all that data down a limited pipe. So there's not that much de degradation in quality if you lose one or two pixels. So it just gives you just gives you everything and hopes that you get enough. Mm -hmm. I think that's the white line that we're seeing, right? In YouTube. Trying to... Yeah, that's the, that's the yeah. buffering. That's how much data yeah. it has. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to load the full video before you get to watch it, you're able to watch it while it's still loading the ahead of it. Yeah, and, and even if they did like blocks or something, mm -hmm. it wound up, it would be too much overhead to like parse that all together and make sure mm -hmm. like, make sure that you got these packets versus these other packets. They just say, nope, you, you're getting what I'm putting out and I'm hoping that, uh, I'm, hoping that I'm giving you enough to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So data flow direction, we have this, I think it's uh, uh, duplex, uh, multiplex, a uh, half, half, half plex? Half, half duplex and multiplex. 
So the duplex is basically just one direction. The source uh, sends information, the sinks receive it. Uh, in the terms of half duplex, the source and sink can both send and receive, but not at the same time. But with multi duplex, see the two lines now, they can send and receive at the same time. Okay. And again, let's go back to this word. Put it in your mind. All people seem to need data processing. I don't want to explain, but that's all people seem to need data processing. Let's go with network topology. It just refers to different geometrical configurations that can be used to build a network. And we have several. We have point to point, point to multi point, multi drop. Bus, ring, or they call it loop as well, far, tree, and mesh. So here's a quick glimpse of what the network topology would look like. You have a star, it doesn't have to look like a star all the time, right? Uh, mesh, ring, bus, tree. We'll explain more. Point-to-point -point topology is basically you have uh, point A to point B. You have one node, the other node. Could be both computers. Could be a computer peripheral. Could be anything. Basically, two equipments or two equipments that can talk to each other. And point-to-point point, mul point multi-point topology basically has one node that can communicate to three other nodes. I know there was a muddiest point with that, but I'll get to that later. Uh, Multi-drop topology is like this. If your node A goes down, everything goes down. Bus topology looks like that. It's easier to implement. Less cables. And for the other topologies, uh, I do have these advantages and disadvantages. So again, it was it's cost effective. Less cables required to connect the nodes. It's also very easy to understand because you just have one, one line, right? Uh, ideal for a small network setup. The bad part is um, if one cable fails, Entire network fails. So when you say primary network cable, it's like if you cut this up, everything goes down. It's unidirectional, meaning one way. Uh, transmission speeds are drastically reduced with the increased number of nodes, meaning if you add uh, G, H, I, J, K, and you want to transmit from the start to J, definitely it would take more time. Right? Uh, ring topology looks like this. Everything is interconnected. Advantages is it performs better than bus topology under heavy network loads. Point to point connectivity of the nodes make it easy to identify and detect misconfigurations or faults. Orderly network flow, cost effective to implement. Uh, disadvantage, however, is one mal malfunctioning node can collapse the whole network because now the node is part of the ring. So a while ago, if you cut the cable or the connection, everything goes down. But now because uh, the node is also part of that, so if you if a node goes down, it cannot A and E cannot communicate. Maybe through the other way around. Bandwidth is shared among all the devices. Reconfiguring, adding, or removing nodes requires the network to shut down because you have to configure the ring. I mean, it's like you already have a perfect ring and you need to increase the size of your, let's say, wedding ring, right? There's no way you can just add stuff. You have to break it apart and put it together. Start topology. Basically, you have a hub. This one is passive. It does not really act as a node. And the hub has several nodes connected to it. 
And the advantage now is failure of one node will not affect the entire network. Devices can be added, removed, reconfigured, or modified without disturbing the network because you can just add node Z and just have a cable and insert that to the hub. Easy to set up and modify, less cabling, easy to troubleshoot. Bad part is the entire network is dependent on the central hub. If this hub goes down, everything goes down. Expensive to install and use. Performance is solely based on the central hub's configuration, power, and efficiency. So if you are an administrator, easier to administer, it may be very costly for you as well. The three topology is basically having a hub and having uh, stars below it. Don't know if we have this one as well. Yep. So. Advantage is it's flexible, scalable, suitable for large network, easy to manage. Because again, we're now maximizing the advantages of hub and also the star topology, put them together. And because of that as well, it becomes more complex and more costly. Mesh topology, basically you have a lot of them bunched up together. And uh, a good example for a mesh topology, it's not really that, um, I don't know if it's popular yet, but for Bluetooth, there's a Bluetooth mesh technology already that you can have in your home, uh, a Bluetooth um, device that can act as its own. It's like a, it's not really an extender, like, because um, you can have like a, Wi-Fi extender, right? That just extends from the source. But if you have a mesh topology, that thing that you think that is an extender is not really an extender. It really would act as a its own Wi-Fi router, something like that. So with the mesh topology, everything is fully connected, robust, provides security and privacy. Uh, any node failures won't affect the network. Less load, collision, dedicated lines, isolation, fault detections are easy. Again, disadvantage is usually implementation, complexity, configuration. So let's go with uh, a lighter topic, geographical coverage. Um, we have um, personal area networks, local area networks, metropolitan area networks, and wide area networks. I'll go ahead and discuss um, metropolitan air network, an example, because I don't have an example in slides. An example would just be is your school campus, school network, right? That's a bigger than local air network. And a wide air network is basically, let's say, U USA. I mean, US network, network of USA, okay? Let's go down a trip of me uh, to my own memory lane. Have you ever seen this before? What technology is this one? Oh, we advanced so much that a lot of us forgot. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Hmm? any more guess? Are you talking about the game or? No, what is the connection that they're doing? They're able to play two, sna two snakes in one screen, right? They're doing multiplayer. Oh, I didn't really do that. Huh? I didn't really do that back then. Oh, really? Oh. Nokia phones have this for even before the Bluetooth days or? Uh, red, red. That's the keyword, red. Infrared technology. You would see on the side of uh, Nokia, you would see that it's like, it's like a glassy, dark red, a dark something like that, that you have to really point to one another to connect. Another example is most remote controls uses infrared as well. So if you block the signal from the remote or from your TV, the receiver, you can't press buttons, okay? I mean, you can't switch channels. Another one that, favorite game, Pokemon. I used to play this like this as well. If you ever wanna battle your friends or uh, trade Pokemons with one another, the old school way you do it is basically have a link cable Again, physical cable, right? Anyone played this? 
No one. Oh my god. I guess you guys live on a different planet. <laughs> this is very, very up to date. Wireless, uh, wireless Bluetooth. Bluetooth technology, right? So if you're using an Apple product, an iPhone, pick it up. Auto connects. Yep. Using the Bluetooth technology. And I think back in the days, we were using Bluetooth more for file exchange. The good old glory days of Torrent, where people download music with viruses, and people just share music through Bluetooth. Oh, do you have a cool ringtone? You send it through Bluetooth. OK. Another one that's, uh, it's kind of dark. You don't really see the console. But if you can guess what handheld device is this? It's a PlayStation. Oh, uh, PSP. PSP. So in this case, um, I was playing this for a long time with my uh, younger brothers before. It's Monster Hunter. Yeah. And the way you play it is you have this wireless ad hoc. So it's basically, I think that's the first time I heard about wireless LAN. And they call it WLAN. Right? If, so if you're like within range, you can basically uh, have a communication with the other device and play multiplayer and play tons of hours with Monster Hunter, Decidia, whatever. And another good old glory days when I played a lot of Ragnarok online when I was growing up. And you would hear the sound of the dial up. Ding, ding, something like that. And yeah, it's a modem, correct. It's a modem. And before, you can't really, you can't really, uh, oh, your access to the internet gets disrupted when someone picks up the phone. Super annoying, right? Why does it make this sound? Like, does it have to make that sound, or is it just something they thought? I don't know. I know. <laughs> A good question. I should have. Because I feel like you take out the one. speaker, then you're, you yeah. know, the sound. It's like, uh, it's like a phone call. Yeah, it's like a yeah. phone call. Yeah, it's like maybe, it's definitely it's a preset. It's like when you're calling someone, yeah. there's a ring. Yeah. Uh, back in the days when um, internet speeds were not yet that fast, and you want to play online games like Dota 2, League of Legends, you can't compete with other people if you have a slow connection. And the only way you ensure you have a fast connection is you basically get the physical cable and insert it to your laptop so you have a consistent speed instead of the Wi-Fi getting a uh, fluctuating um, network speed. But right now, I would say it's, still, it's more reliable than before. Uh, this is the very first, that's not me, but that's the, f this game was the very first game I played in my second grade school, Counter-Strike. And the way you play it is basically you have a LAN party. That's what they call it. But it's basically underneath it, all of them are connected with cables, LAN cables. Lots of cables. Lots of cables, yeah. And I didn't notice that. <laughs> it's a weird picture. There. There's a human hanging there playing Counter-Strike as well, I think. Yeah, he's duct tape up to the ceiling. Yeah. And just a fun fact. If now playing online games, it's um, you can just play by yourself and connect with other people. The annoying part with this one is when you have someone beside you and he's on the enemy team, he can easily see your screen. Yeah. Terrible. Okay, so I think we're done with the fun part. Let's go back to transmission medium. We have guided transmission and wireless transmission. Uh, wireless, you already know wireless. Guided is just basically a physical one, right? Let's say cables. Data transfer technique, we do have two things. We have the switching and broadcasting. So uh, let's go first with the example of broadcasting. If you've heard about broadcasting like in TV stations, Definitely, that's it. 
and think of it, your device is your TV. So before we have TVs and antennas, right? And when someone in the TV station broadcasts something, everyone receives it. So that's basically the broadcasting part. And the switching, it does include um, two stuff. You have the circuit switch networks and packet switch networks. Uh, it basically handles organization of blocks to send data. And again, we can, de we can go deeper with this, uh, think later. Uh, network access techniques, we do have the call setup phase. An easier way to understand that is basically the call setup phase is the one establishing the communication path. It's like, let's say, uh, this is an island, this is an island, and you put a bridge. So that's the call setup phase. It's creating that bridge. And then now you have the data transfer phase, trend, uh, which is you transmit after the communication pattern is established. So you do this first, and once you have that bridge, now you can send stuff, data, right? Not only that, but we also have to clear them out. We call it call teardown phase. So you put the bridge, you send the data, no more data sent, destroy that bridge, or that communication path. Just technical terms. So again, we have the packet switching, broad network access, centralized polling. You could skip this for now. Media sharing technique, we have frequency division, multiplexing, time division, multiplexing. Uh, I'm gonna skip this as well. But please, please let me know. If you want me to discuss this, then I can do that next week. Because I wanna go deeper with OSI for now. But if you wanna go with this, it's a very interesting topic just because it deals with me, uh, video, audio, analog signals. And again, all people seems to need data processing, right? Do you agree, do you agree? Do you agree? Is anyone catching why I keep saying this? Because it's about the SLI uh, layer. Okay, good. So, welcome to open systems interconnection models. We do have seven layers, and all people seems to need data processing. It's just an acronym for you guys to, to really not forget the sequence. Because it has a sequence. So you have application layer, presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and physical layer. Okay, don't forget that sequence. Let's start with an analogy first. Uh, start from the top. Um, let's say there's a post office, and we start with the application layer. You write a 20 page letter to a foreign com country, let's say from here to the Philippines. Uh, the presentation layer would translate that layer. Let's say I wanted English to Filipino, something like that. Let's say you translate that to Filipi uh, Filipino language and the session layer would now ensure that the intended recip recipient can receive the letter. So things that they can ensure that is maybe the post office can verify the address. Does that, does that location even exist? Okay. Uh, T, the transport layer, it can separate in the number of pages, like registered mail, tracks delivery requests, another package, if one is lost, damage in the way, mail. Meaning, the transport layer, what it can do, if let's say 20 page is very big to put in one envelope, it might do four envelopes, so four, 20 divided by four and put them in four envelopes, right? And then it will try to, again, transport them. And hopefully um, the four is received. If not, let's say the third one is lost, it will generate that same third mail to have that complete one, two, three, four, complete that 20 pages letter. Next we go to the network, okay? The postal center sorting letters by zip code to route them closer to the destination. 
So deals with routing. Okay. Uh, data link. Local post office determines which vehicles to deliver letters. The clue here is vehicles. We're now dealing with the physical stuff, almost physical stuff. The media that would deliver that stuff. Okay. Um, physical is basically the trucks, planes, rails, auto, which carry the letter between stations. Okay. I have more analogies. Uh, I found this in YouTube. Uh, I'll explain it and have you just view it in your free time. So one thing that you really, really have to take note when we talk about the seven layers, especially when you say application, it's not the apps. It's not the apps, it's the protocol. So there's a bunch of protocols per layer, okay? And for the application layer, as you can see here, these are the different types of protocols which we have been using every day. HTTP, HTTPS, when we go to Facebook, Twitter, city.edu, uh, and this one breaks it down more. So FTP, file transfer, and this one, this guy is happily web surfing. If we need to send email, we are using the SMTP protocol. If you're using virtual terminals, you're using Telnet. And as you can see, the, those are applications, and these are the application layer protocols. Okay. So far, so good. Next, presentation layer. Its main job is basically to translate, compress, and encrypt. So given the data, it will translate to say binary numbers, and it will try to compress that. As you can see, it has less binary. It could be lossy or lossless, and then it can encrypt that as well through secure solid layer and other stuff. A uh, good example with this is when when we transmit. Uh, let's say you upload your photos in Facebook. Most of the time, you don't really get. 100% of your high quality picture from your phone. So what they do that is they really compress that. That's called compression. Another example is back in the days, if you buy CD, uh, let's say music album, when you save that in your computer, it would um, have a file size of around, I think it can be around 126 megabytes for just one song album. And when you download it from the internet, it's going to be compressed. I'll give an example here with that song album. So one song, so an uncompressed one song could, uh, could have around 8 to 12 megabytes with just one song. But if you start compressing that, which we normally consume in Spotify and torrents when you download, it's already compressed. And that's why we only get like two megabytes, three megabytes, but as you can see, the sound quality changes as well. Another good tip is, if you're the kind of guy who loves algorithms and you develop a new type of data compression that has less uh, impact on data quality, you're gonna be very, very rich. So again, application layer protocols are the following. And presentation layer, its job is to translate the data, compress, encrypt. Now we move on with the session layer. Uh, focus first on this line, the red line. Basically, that's the connection that was established. And the session layer is the one basically um, looking on it, right? So it's like when you, uh, Go to your Facebook, that's a session. When you connect, when you're authenticated and authorized to go to your own account, the connection is established, and now you have a session. And it depends on the application or your own configuration of how long you want the session to last. It could be, oh, never log me out. Or it could be, oh, whenever I 
close my Facebook tab, ask me for signing again, right? So session layer, main takeaway is it, it looks, I mean, it monitors what's happening. Transport layer, it's a bit, a bit a lot. You have the segmentation, flow control, and error control. And segments, uh, think of first you have one big data. And a while ago with the 20 pages, right? One big data, and when you put them in separate, uh, uh, you divide them, let's say, by three, we call them segment one, segment two, segment three, or data unit one, two, and three. So that's useful. So um, in such a way that in the segment as well, you put which port it would need to go to, something like that. So it would know that, oh, you want to access WhatsApp. Oh, this data is for, um, uh, should be sent to Firefox or Chrome, right? Another way is basically you have one data again, and you only want to send it to one. Moving on. Flow control. Uh, let's say you have a very powerful computer, like a gaming desktop or laptop. It can, let's say, transmit around 100 Mbps. And you just have a mobile device with 10 Mbps. If you started transferring, uh, let's say, a one, giga, one gigabit file and using 100 megabytes per second, the mobile device can't really cope up with that, and you might lose a lot of um, uh, data as well during transmission, just because someone is receiving 100 megabytes of file when I can just receive 10 megabytes of file per second. So transfer layer can fix this problem by communicating to say, hey, can you put down your uh, transmission speed to only 10 megabytes per second so I can consume everything and not lose any data. And it also works the other way around. If you have, let's say, uh, mobile device, uh, I mean, uh, let's say this one is on, um, only transmitting five megabytes per second for some reason, but it, it can do 10 megabytes per second. It, the transfer layer can also say that, hey, can you increase the, uh, the uh, transmission uh, file size per second to 10 megabytes per second. So it can increase or decrease that with the flow control. So that's still in the transport layer. Uh, transport layer also deals with the error control. Um, it's called the automatic repeat request. I think the acronym for that is ARQ. Uh, what it basically does is you have one big data, it breaks down to um, three units, and once it's sent to the other device, and let's say the other device did not receive the second data unit, it will basically try to reset this data unit too to complete it. Okay, transport layer. Again, as we mentioned that these layers have these protocols. So you can first look at this one, the protocols. We have the transmission control protocol, TCP. You might have heard that before. Uh, we have the user data gram protocol, so UDP. And TCP is basically a connection-oriented transmission, and UDP is a connection-less transmission. So an example, uh, TCP, go first with TCP. Uh, it's low, but it does give you feedback. Uh, an example for that one is uh, file transfer. Uh, UDP on the other hand is, it, it's fast, but does not give feedback. And the examples they give it is video games, uh, audio, uh, I think this is a call. So it doesn't really care if it loses data quality. Uh, an example is when you talk over someone at the phone, it, you don't really need to 
um, like store the the voice right you just need to hear it even though sometimes it it has a poor quality it's fine however if let's say you're doing um, text messaging right you want whatever you text to be the exact same thing right network layer network layer has three things it has the log logical addressing the routing and path determination so logical addressing is basically your IPv4 IP address and then IPv6 plus mask masking routing as well path determination let's see oh the path determination uh, path determination uh, for you study algorithms uh, basically you need algorithms to know the shortest path so uh, example of this one is let's say you're here in Seattle and you want to send data to let's say Boston it does not go straight to Boston it would jump around different nodes let's say there's a uh, node in Chicago, node in Alabama. So with the path determination, it would check what's the shortest path, path to reach Boston, okay? Um, I think this is part of uh, routing. Yeah, routing. So this is an example of first the logical addressing. So. This is the Facebook IP address, and this is the IP address of network uh, computer B. So essentially what this um, diagram is showing is computer B access Facebook, and before going to the Facebook server, it basically goes to its own network, right? And then goes up to request for Facebook server. Uh, correction, this is wrong, this should be 255, 255, 255, uh, Basically the mass would, this is the mass, the 255, the mass would be the one telling how to read the IP, IP address that says that the first uh, three sequence is the uh, network and the last number is basically the host. Which computer? Computer. Okay. And as you can see, there's the packet here. And again, packet is your like data. Data link layer. You have the logical addressing. You got that from the network layer. And now with the data link layer, we have the physical addressing. So we start introducing the uh, concept of frame. Think of your frame as just a container, a box, right? So if computer one would want to send something to computer two, uh, the data link layer would attach this one, the Mac uh, Media Access Control one, media, media Access Control two, and the data, which is in the segment as well, in the tail. So this is like your container. So it would know the source, and it would know the uh, the sync again, the recipient. Uh, it would also know uh, the IP addresses and the data. And then, again, as the data link protocol, the one main takeaway that you should remember is it's using media. As we said a while ago, media are those physical stuff. It's not or the wireless stuff. Not really the audio and video that you know of. So media ports. Okay. So the way we try to show that again is this is device one, the happy computer, the device two, which is the laptop. So it goes like this. So when data is going to be sent from one device to another, they would put that in a frame. This is the, the packet is the data. This is the, the container. And when it reaches R1, right, 
what it does first is remove this. We call it uh, P encapsulate. Basically, you remove that container and have that same data and put it with the new container again. So framing is like that. They, um, again, it's like this box. I put tissue paper here. I give it to him. What he would do is remove all the tissue paper and put it in a new box, which happens here. Okay, so that would keep happening. So let's say it got passed on to R2, another network. The R2 would remove all the stuff, let's say the tissue paper from the container, grab a new container. The container, again, it's called frame, okay? okay? Grabs a new container, puts the data there or the tissue paper, and now it can send it to the other end and get the data. And also the data link layer, uh, the data link layer includes three. One is the framing, as you can see on the upper right. This is the framing. Framing is basically like a container. Whenever you send it out, you put that in a frame or container. Whenever someone receives it, you remove that container or that frame and then create a new frame to send it to the other device. Next is um, part of the data link layer is it also provides uh, media access control and error detection. So think of your LAN cable, optical fiber, air, or wireless. That's your media access control. Again, media, not a video or audio, it's your physical device. So with a, some simple typing, again, you can disable your Wi-Fi. I used to do that with my younger brothers. When they are downloading something and I'm playing uh, computer games, I need the bandwidth. I just go to their laptop and they don't know. I type some stuff, disable their Wi-Fi, and they think, something is wrong. <laughs> it's like, I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah, so I did a lot of um, fun stuff before. I even, I think I even tried doing, um, editing their host name file in their laptop in such a way that, for example, you go to Facebook, but it goes to somewhere else and they don't know what's happening. But I just edited something in their DNS. Um, we now move on to the uh, layer one, which is physical layer. Uh, before we go to the physical layer, that at first we have a segment. Segment is basically data that was broken apart. Okay, and let's say the data is high. Um, that comes from the transport layer, and then when we go to the uh, network layer, you would include the. Uh, it becomes a packet. You would include where it comes from, and where does it need to go to, plus the data. Once it goes to the data link layer, we now have a different concept called framing. You also include the packet, and you include the source media access control and destination media access control, right? So LAN cables, wireless. Okay. Uh, as you can see right now is whenever it goes to <coughs> down the layer, you try to add more stuff, okay? It's different from the framing, because again, in framing, when data link layer goes to another uh, data link layer, framing is what is being done. And then once we reach the physical layer, it will have this, this. The 1001 binary numbers, or the alien language. So why one zeros and one zeros? Because machines un can only understand ones and zeros. So it's like when we talked about the database before. You have an English interface, becomes SQL query, becomes ones and zeros. Same goes with uh, network. You have the data, becomes ones and zeros as well. And this physical layer, as you can see, signals you have electrical signals, I think this is my ball, Wi-Fi signal. Uh, you can also have media cables, 
right? So this is basically the uh, the transmission from one play one device to another, and what really happens here is it goes to from the first layer, the application layer, goes down until here, the physical layer, and now once it's ready to be converted to a signal, send it back, and then now the other end receives it on the other way around, from the bottom to the top, from physical layer going to the application layer. Again, the source, from the source, it goes from application to the physical layer, and then when the destination receives it, it goes from physical layer to application layer. Uh, so the OSI model, if you put si it side by side with the internet, basically the first three layers, the application presentation layer and session layer includes the user process layer. It's basically what the user sees. Uh, or it's happening on the source computer. Uh, transfer layer is just transfer layer. Network layer would be the internet layer and data link layer and physical layer would be the network access layer. Uh, so internet layer, it has the internet protocol, the IPs, IP address. And if you remember a while ago, transport layer, there's two types. We have the uh, TCP and UDP, the transmission control protocol and user data gram protocol. Okay, I wanna still Put the OSI to your mind, your brains. Um, if you think about the first three layers, is the software layer. And if you think about the last three layers, we're talking about the hardware layer. And transport layer is pretty much like the middle that glues them all. Um, in the next slides, this is just some few words that hopefully it sticks to your mind so that when someone asks you what's this, you can answer right away. So in the application layer, basically to allow access to network resources. Presentation, we discussed this, it translates, encrypt, compress data. Uh, session layer, it establishes the connection. Again, we'll talk about the bridge. Establishes that, manage, and also terminate, okay? Uh, examples are the API, sockets, uh, WinSock. So API, application programming interface, is when you want to reach uh, another endpoint that would uh, give you access to data. Uh, sockets, uh, an example would be web sockets. So that's the technology behind uh, real-time chat. WinSock, uh, not sure with that. Uh, transport layer to provide reliable process to process message delivery and error delivery. And as we said a while ago, uh, it will try to uh, segment the data that you have to uh, small parts and try to send it to the destination. And if one is missing, it will try to resend that. Network layer. Uh, it basically moves packets from source to destination to provide internet working. Data link layer to organize bits into frames, provide hop to hop delivery. Physical layer transmits bits over a medium, provide mechanical and electrical specification, fiber, wireless, hubs, repeaters. Okay, main takeaway again, just don't forget this. Uh, again, another image. Application layer is the end user layer. When we say end user, it's you accessing a browser. It's the you as a user. You're the last user. That's why it's end user. And the protocols you have for that. Main word protocols: HTTP, FTP, IRC, SSH, DNS. Uh, DNS. Uh, it's a domain name system. It's basically the phone book of the internet. If you put facebook.com, it would look at uh, 
domain name system to check what's the IP address for Facebook.com. Okay, it's the phone book. It sounds like when you hit the Facebook.com, it goes to DNS right away. Turns out it's not really the case right away. It, there's a lot of sequence that it can check. It can check your browser. Does my browser cache has this? No. Does my operation, operating system cache has this? No. Does my router has this? No. Uh, how about my ISP provider? And then if all else fails, it will go to domain name system to check for that. Again, when you talk about cache, it's just basically storing that data so it doesn't have to keep hitting the DNS to look for the IP address. Okay. Presentation layer is your syntax layer, um, another word for it. Um, the protocols is the secure sockets layer, SSH. Uh, SSH, for those of you guys, you try to make a secure connection to your uh, rem remote servers or instances, you do SSH. IMAP, FTP, MPEG, JPEG, because again, why do we have MPEG and, well, MPEG, I haven't seen this for a long time, and JPEG. Um, basically, because we try to compress them as well, right? Session, you sync, send to port, you have the API, socket, WinSock. Transport, you have end-to-end -end connections. Don't forget about the protocols, TCP and UDP. Uh, TCP is, is the one that's fast or slow? Quickly check that. TCP is the one that's slow, but gives feedback. And oops, and UDP is the one that's fast. It doesn't uh, ensure data quality. Network, always think about packets, okay? Uh, packets essentially are segments. What are segments? Segments are basically data. So again, packets basically include the source and destination IP plus the segment and that becomes a packet. Uh, protocols is the IP, ICMP, IPsec, IGMP. Data link now, we get that packet and put the uh, MAC address control for the source and destination as well. And when we put that together, it becomes a frame and we have the internet, PDP, switch and bridge. Lastly, physical structure is the physical layer and fiber, coaxial, hubs, repeaters, wireless. And as you can see here, uh, the OSI model first, in the outer, uh, the outer uh, text, when you transmit data, it goes from application layer down to physical, and then <coughs> now the receiver will receive it from the physical then going up to the application layer. And when we talked about the data types that we were mentioning, the keywords, if it's from application, presentation, session, right? Data, data, data. Still called data. But when, once it goes to transport, it's going to be called segment. We put it, uh, we divide the data into data units, it becomes a segment. Uh, and when it goes through the network, it becomes packet. And packets include the source IP, destination IP. And data link would be the frames, which includes the packet plus the source MAC and destination MAC. And last one is the bits, the ones and zeros where the machine can understand it. Okay, all people seem to need data processing. So here's a visual representation of what it looks like. So it, from L7, you know that it's the application layer. And every time it moves down, the data acquires something else from that layer. Okay? So it just shows you from the data, grabs something like a header file from uh, application layer, grabs something again from the uh, presentation layer, session layer, L4 is the transport layer, network, data link, and last one, physical. 
because it becomes ones and zeros, it was decoded. Okay, I think now we're on the chapter, we're moving away from the OSI model. I hope um, it gets to your brain. Uh, we can now proceed with data link layer protocols. Um, we talked about this, responsible for organizing data in frames and for detecting errors that occur in a frame. Okay. As, as you can see, uh, we have the leading and trailing, and we have the flag header, payload, checksum, and flag. I would just focus on, um, first is the payload, is basically the data that you included in your frame. Uh, checksum is basically the thing that would check if uh, there's some errors in your frame and resubmit that uh, frame. Um, and you also talked about bit stuffing. Uh, it would ensure transmission starts and end in the correct places. And basically the trick here is when it sees a consecutive uh, five ones, it would insert a zero. And then the recipient would now also go for the consecutive five ones and then remove the zero. Okay. Um, we're using bit stuffing. Uh, one of the reasons is to keep or preserve the uniqueness of the flag in the frame, flags in the frame. So for flow control, we do have the stop and wait protocol and the sliding window flow control. I think contro control as well. Yeah, it's not protocol. Stop and wait flow control. So AACK this basically means it's acknowledged. Uh, sender receiver, you can see them in uh, top and bottom. Uh, what happens here is the sender when he receives, uh, when the sender sends a data to the receiver, it, the sender, before sending another file, okay, again, the sender sends a file, and before sending another file or data, it must first receive acknowledgement from the receiver. That I have received your first data or file, and now you can proceed to send me the next one. So it's gonna be like that. Sliding window, on the other hand, would have uh, accumulate, let's say I want four files. Or, yeah, that's four files. And then send it to the receiver. And then I'll wait for that um, acknowledgement again. Basically, RR4 would just say that I have received uh, this amount of, um, this number of uh, data or files, and you can send me another one. Stop, wait, automatic repeat request. So this is what we discussed with the, uh, one of the layers. Uh, we can quickly go back to that. Show. It's the error, um, error, con yeah, automatic repeat request. So this was part of transport layer, right? The automatic repeat request. If something is missing, you send it again. So if you go back there, it's basically the same thing. It's just in a diagram. So what happens here, if file zero, I send it to the receiver. The receiver uh, got, gets the file zero. Uh, receiver acknowledges that he has received file zero. Sender would send file one and sends it to the receiver. And then let's say the receiver lost that file. It could give a NAC, like I did not receive any of it. So once sender receives the, oh, uh, looks like receiver did not get that file one. I'll resend it. He'll keep doing that until he, he acknowledged that he receives file one. 
unless you put exceptions that um, when you, let's say, try to send it four times and it did not work, just stop. Okay. Go back for automatic repeat request. So it's like the sliding window, but again, it has um, a lot of more data that accumulates first and send it. And it needs also the uh, acknowledge and uh, not acknowledge. Okay, data link control protocols supervise the retransmission of corrupted frames and regulate the transfer of frames, which we have been talking about. Um, data link control protocols has the HDLCP, which is a high data link control protocols. I think this is uh, one of the things that you have to know if you're gonna take like Linux exam or a network plus, point to point protocol and frame relay. Don't forget all people seems to need data processing. We'll now dig into Maria's point. Um, first, what is the function of data link layer? It can access the media through framing and it could control how media is placed and a and B, and received through media access control and error detection. Keywords again is the media, um, error detection, and flow control. Another Matthias point, how do you protect data from hackers during communication process? Uh, encryption, secure socket layer, virtual private network. This gives you a clue already, and this is in presentation layer, where we translate, uh, compress, and encrypt. The one that surprised me is the data is converted into electrical form, and I'm really curious of how they do transform the data. Um, again, um, we talked about this, I think, before the class started. If the signal is measurable, definitely you could uh, get digital information and get numbers and data for it. Uh, let me know for next week as well if you wanna go dig deeper here as well. Um, I've done some uh, research on this before just because uh, if you've done DJing or music production, you have to know this stuff and how the analog signal works the sine wave, the cosine wave, all of those. And a good question, I like questions like this, that how it relates to you, because that's one of the struggle with teaching a networking class is, how does it relate to me, right? So a good question with this one. Sometimes my home internet is able to be connected, but no internet access. Which layer went wrong could lead to, could lead to this result? So there's a lot of questions to ask. It's basically a troubleshooting uh, process. So we can ask, is your network cable plugged in? Very first question. I know it's dumb, but sometimes that's happened. So that's a physical layer. Is there a link light on the Ethernet switch and Ethernet and AC? It's data link. Do you have an IP address? That's a network layer problem, right? You, you may need to change your IP address, or flush your DNS, whatever. Can you, ping your can you ping your default gateway? Meaning can you reach uh, that default gateway and receive a response if you are connected to the gateway? So that's network layer, testing LAN IP connectivity. Do you have um, DNS server information? Uh, that's out there already. Can you ping your DNS server network, testing IP connectivity? Um, even before um, transitioning to the tech field, um, I did a lot of pinging just because, again, when I was playing computer games, I always need to ping to check if my um, machine, my, my machine is connecting fast to the game server or else why even play it? Well, I just die anyway, right? Do you have a firewall configured? 
uh, network on top on up to application can you ping the host you are trying to get to by name application layer dns network uh, one ip connectivity uh, application because the protocol is http https sometimes you might miss that oh you just did http and it should be https and also it could be because maybe it's region blocked for games or internet access what format is the graphic in do you have a viewer for that format presentation layer can your web browser open up another website basic application troubleshooting so it doesn't have to be the osi all the time but still it's good to know because again with ip config command you would learn a lot with what's happening with your system um, are you able to look up personal area networks to create a larger range so there's this uh, current technology right now which is called bluetooth mesh uh, it's basically the ability to, for each node meaning each bluetooth device to act as a viable operator in a network and also have the ability to relay messages from other nodes in the network. Again, the difference from this one is it's not your typical extender that it extends from one source and eats that bandwidth away as well. This one, it acts like another source. Okay? And I think mesh technology is also being used for uh, cars, uh, maybe self-driving cars, if they get to implement that correctly. A star topology looks similar to point, to multi-point topology, what's the difference between them? So the main difference is for, um, for star topology, all of them are connected to a centralized location or point, right? So the good thing is if the cables going through the other nodes is cut, it's, it's fine, it still works. You can just add another node. However, if your centralized device failed, I mean your centralized location failed, everything goes down. For P, P2NP, which is the uh, one-to-many connection, um, based on the research, it's basically, uh, an, uh, it's, it basically grabbed the concept of star topology and extended it. Another type of topology from that one. So. Um, I've been seeing a lot of people saying that they're kind of being used interchangeably. So they're very similar, I would say. Um, let's see. So we do have some time. So I'd like to have a very, very easy exercise for now to introduce you before we even go to subnets, right? Um, Exercise is basically binary IP calculation, decimal to using decimal to binary and binary to decimal. So it's, it's, I'm not just going to give you series of number. I'm going to give you IP address, and we have to convert them to binary and vice versa. So to quickly give you an overview, an IP address have let's say four sequences, right? Three numbers, three numbers, two numbers, one. Could be more numbers, but you have the dot to separate the four sequences. And they call it as octets. Okay? So when we try to dissect them, octet one is basically 192. Octet two is 168. Octet three is 90. And octet four is one. So the question is how do we get the binary? numbers or the bits we're gonna use this table okay so without even really explaining this one we can start off by using this table and putting everything zero here first grab the 192 lock it with this one and when you use that one you flip it to one and when you deduct 192 with 190, uh, 128, you end up with the number 64, right? And check with the 
next number that would allow you to um, uh, to absorb that 64 number as well, which is this one. And now you can flip the switch. Meaning, I used 128 and 64 number to end up with 192. And what happens now for my octet one, which is 192 in decimal format, I now have my binary numbers or my bits for that octet. So you can basically do the same thing for let's say, given the octet number for one, what is your bits? Give me the answer. So it would be zero, 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 one, right? And for octet three, it's 90. I can't use this, so zero. I can use this, one. 90 minus 64, it's 26, I can't use this, so zero again. I can use this, one. 26 minus 16 is 10. So 10 is greater than eight, I can use this. Put this at one. I still have two, I can't use this, zero. Two is equal to two, I can't, one. And do the same. So for our very, very simple activity is, oh, that's the answer for that one. As you can see, it started with this one, so one there. And this is how you represent the IP address in the uh, bits format. Again, um, as you are trying to learn more in computer science, one thing that you don't, you should not forget is you should know how the computer thinks. You should know how the computer adds number. You should know how the computer reads data. So. Don't ever, ever forget that. So given this exercise, it would be very simple. I'd like you guys to quickly stand up and form a group, not your team group mate, and basically give me the answer for this one. We can try to draw the, uh, this one. Gravity, try to solve. Should be very, very easy. Before that is we'll basically um, create a table to do our manual computation. So how do we create the table from 1 to 128? So first you have to think about that um, we have to use the number 2. Raised to 0 is 1. 2 raised to, to 1 is 2. 2 raised to 2 is 4. And 2 up to the, up to the end, 2 raised to 7 is 128. Why did we choose two? It's because binary numbers has ones and zeros, so you have two numbers to represent. That's why you use two as your base number and now have exponent whenever you go further, okay? So the first answer for the first octet of 192, 192 minus 128, you use that, so you put one, and you have 64, so you can use 64, you put one, and the rest is zero. And next is you have zero, if you still talk, thought about what to do, that's a problem. So zero is a zero, um, a bunch of zeros in your bits. Uh, 66, you would definitely not look at 128, but you can look at 164 because 66 is bigger than 64. So you can put one there, and then now you have the difference of two. And now on the, uh, the, the other numbers like 32, 16, eight, and four, wouldn't be used, so we put zeros on them, and two can be used, so put one, and the last one is zero. So, um, let's see, another, let's do it the other way around before we take a break. Um, how about binary uh, bits to uh, IP address? So, yeah, and again, We'll make it easy so you can still use the table, do manual computation, right? This, this is just an example of the table. This is not the correct answer. So we are on one one zero. Yeah. Oh, we're trying to get the higher number? They're trying to convert the bits to IP address. Yeah. Binary number to the decimal. 